is Science Max. Experiments at large. Science Max! Welcome to Science Max Experiments at Large. I'm Phil McCordick, and today we're going to be building one of the most devastating, one of the most powerful machines known to medieval man using a plastic spoon, among other things. We're gonna be building a catapult. Catapults were used throughout history for all kinds of reasons, to throw all kinds of things, but mostly big stone blocks at castle walls in order to knock them down. Here's what you need in order to build your own catapult. You need elastics, uh, pencils, uh, unsharpened is fine, plastic spoons, like I said, and popsicle sticks. Popsicle, popsicle sticks. Popsicle sticks. Um, I'm gonna go wash my hand. So here's the science behind what we're doing today. It's all about elastic force. Elasticity is a property of solid materials, like this elastic, and how much they tend to return to their original shape when deformed, like when I pull on it. Elastics are called elastics because they're great at doing just that. You can pull on it and pull on it and pull on it, and it'll, ow, 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 always return to its original shape. So we are using the power of elastic force today. Ow. Now it's time for a Science Max quiz. Elasticity is the ability for a material to return to its original shape when deformed, like this or this. Which of these materials have elasticity? A rubber band, a pencil, or a rock? Haha! -ha, this is a trick question. The answer is all three. Most solid materials have elasticity. Nearly everything will deform a little and still be able to return to its original shape. It all depends on how much. This is a steel bar. This is an elastic band. And this is an ice cream sundae. We're not talking about ice cream sundaes now, though. So get that out of here. Good. Now a steel bar and an elastic band both have elasticity. A steel bar can be stretched to 1% of its length and still spring back. A rubber band can be stretched 300% or more. The difference between the two is why we make balls out of rubber and buildings out of steel. Because the other way around wouldn't be good for balls or buildings. This has been a Science Max quiz. All right, let's build our catapult. The first step, take four pencils and stick your popsicle stick in between so you have two on the top and two on the bottom. And then use your elastic to go around and around and around. That's why I like building things with elastics because it makes it very fast to tie things together because once you go around and you have it nice and tight, you just pop it over the end and voila, it stays together. And that is how you start making your frame. Put more pencils on that side and another popsicle stick on the other end held on at the corners with more elastics. Then take even more elastics and put them right around the middle until you get this. I've added a few more elastics around the middle here, and that is where we're gonna get all of our elastic force. I think I have six. The more you use, the better it's going to work. Take your popsicle stick, stick it in between the elastics, and then start spinning it around. Here's the reason I use pencils and popsicle sticks is because the pencils are a little bit longer, which allows you to twist the popsicle stick around in the middle and build up the elastic force. Now, because I'm twisting, the elastic force we're using here is called torsion or twisting force. When you feel you have enough torsion, pull your popsicle stick down a little bit so it won't unwind on you, and you'll see that you have all kinds of elastic energy. Then, take your spoon and stick it on the popsicle stick, and you can also break off the popsicle stick if you wanna make sure it's the right length, and it works like that. To make the frame, you just need more pencils and elastics. The trick is to make a triangle with two pencils attached to your frame. They should stick up right where your catapult arm would be fully upright. Then, take a final pencil and put it across the top. Don't forget to pull the arm back before you put the pencil across, otherwise it'll end up on the wrong side. 
Now, this is very complicated, and I went pretty fast, so if you want the step-by-step -step instructions on exactly how to build this, go to our website. And there you go, a catapult of your very own that you can use to knock down very small castle walls. I've also built a larger catapult using all of the same principles. Pretty good, huh? It's got a longer arm, which means I can throw marshmallows even further. Whoa. Or I can throw larger marshmallows. Or I can throw very large marshmallows. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Phil, is that the largest catapult you're gonna make? Well, of course not. This is Science Max, experiments at large. I'm headed to the center for skills development and training, and we're gonna max out the catapult so that it's big enough to throw one of these. Hey, Phil. How you doing? All right. This is Zach. He's a mechanical engineer. You build machines for a living, right? That's right. Great, because I need help building a catapult. OK, but what's with the pumpkin? Well, the pumpkin is what I want to throw out of the catapult. Um, see, I figure we just take the small design and we just make it so that we can throw one of these. Mm -hmm. What do you think? You're going to need a really big catapult. Yeah, and I'm also going to need some really big elastics. Where do you get those? Well. In medieval times, they used rope to make large catapults. Oh, OK. Well, rope is a lot easier to get, and that would be fine. Uh, and I want to make this arm uh, as long as this piece of wood here. This is going to be a huge catapult. It's a huge catapult. I guess we should build it outside, though, huh? Let's do it. OK, it's, it's over that way. OK. Yeah, I'll follow you. Sure. Do you want a hand with that? No, no, I'm fine. You go ahead, and okay. I'll, I'll just, maybe if you hold the door open for me, I could just hold. No, it's... You know what? You go, and I'll, I'll meet you. Make sure you go. Our full-size catapult is going to look a lot like the popsicle stick version. We start with a four-sided frame and add some legs on the bottom. Our spoon is going to be replaced by a long throwing arm with a basket on the end. Then we need a really strong cross brace at the top to stop the arm. Just like in the small version, using a triangle shape is the best because triangles are very strong. Finally, we need something to wind around and around, which is going to give us our elastic force. Instead of elastics, we're going to be using rope for our catapult because rope has just the right amount of elasticity. But unlike medieval times, we're going to be catapulting pumpkins. Once Zach and I got it all put together, it looked like this. OK, we have built a catapult. Check it out. It's pretty solid, and I think it's pretty amazing. And just like in the small catapult, we have our elastic force. But this time, we're using rope. Right, Zach? Yes. OK, and rope will work as well as the elastic did in the small one? Yeah. All right, great. So what do we do? It's really well, we loose need, now. We need to wind this up so oh that we put God. some okay, tension into it. it. Go. The reason a catapult works is because the rope is twisted. The elasticity in the rope wants to unwind, which gives the catapult its power. Just like the small wind catapults, it. the like more that. you wind it, the better it works. Good. Usually in medieval days, they had whole teams of people doing this job. <laughs> but it's just me and Zach now. How you doing, Zach? All right. OK. And then we clamp it on here. So the thing doesn't unwind, right? Yeah. Good. All right. Now we have our pumpkin. And we're going to fire our pumpkin in our castle wall, which is made out of cardboard boxes over there. Pumpkin. All right, here we go. Pull on the arm back. Oh, oh, that elastic force is pretty strong. OK. How do you think we're, you think that pumpkin's a good size? Oh, it's pretty big. You think? Oh, a little too it's big. Too, it's too big for our basket. Yeah. Smaller pumpkin. Smaller pumpkin. I'll hold this. No rush, Zach. No rush. Oh, OK, uh, rush, Zach. Uh, can't hold. Oh, yeah. Man. Can't hold arm. OK, ready? One, two, three. It didn't work that well. No, um, not quite that well. Yeah, so it went, and it flew, and it landed here. 
which is a little farther yep. away from the wall than I'd short. like it to be. One third of the way to the wall! I don't know if that's enough. What do we do to make it better? Well, the way we're throwing it right now, we just have the pumpkin in a, you know, at the end of the arm. So yep. if we bake, make some kind of a sling so that we fling it as we're bringing it up. We make a sling? Yes. All right, I don't know how to make a sling, but you know how? Sure. All right, we'll make it and then you can explain how it works. Yeah. All right, good. Let's put the pumpkin over here. We'll put it, we'll recycle it later. Max Historica. Good morrow to you. I am Lord Fillington III and welcome to my medieval castle. Throughout history, lords and kings have built castles and walls to keep people out. I built my castle to protect my prize collection of snow globes. I have so very many, and they're all mine. Ha <laughs> ha! Oh, hello! You down there, you can't come in. This is my castle. And throughout history, there have been people who've been wanting to get into those castles because Lord Fillington has been hogging all the snow globes, and I, well, I'd like to look at them. But the odd part is figuring out how to get into the castle, because I can't just come up to the wall and start hammering on it. Huh? Taste the wrath of my water balloon! Because, because if I get too close to the castle, he can get me. Ha 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 ha! Fortunately, there's this thing called a catapult. Oh, fiddlesticks. They have a catapult. What you do is you put something heavy in the end here, and the catapult fires it at the walls of the castle, knocks them down, all from far enough away that the people in the castle can't get to you. Ah! Oh, I surrender! Don't knock my walls down! Oh, it'll take me all week to fix them! Oh! All right, all right, you can have a snow globe. <laughs> and that's how catapults were used in history. Oh, so beautiful. <laughs> Back to our maxed out catapult. Our first design threw a pumpkin just like it was supposed to, except it only threw it one third of the way to the wall. Now Zach and I are planning to outfit the catapult with a sling. The sling attaches to the end of the throwing arm and gives the pumpkin a lot more distance to travel. Because the pumpkin is traveling a longer distance in the same amount of time, it will be going faster, which will hopefully get it to the wall, or at least a lot farther than before. So we built this sling. How does this work, Zach? Well, we've got one end tied here. Yeah. And then we put the pumpkin in here. Wait, wait. OK, pulling arm down. Pulling arm down. <sighs> OK, yeah, now what? Now we put the pumpkin in here. Put the pumpkin in there. And yeah. And we loop this over the back of the, oh. over that. As the throwing arm goes up, this will slide off the back of the throwing arm and it will release the pumpkin. All right, you're the expert, I believe you. Let's try it out. Three, two, one. Oh. Whoa! Okay, that Better. works really well. You know what the problem is, though? We still don't have enough oomph. Yeah, it needs more power. Need, well, so what do we do? I don't know if we can crank that rope anymore. Uh, I think we're at the limit of our rope power, but if we added some more elastic... I thought we weren't going to use elastic. Well, we used elastics in our small demo model, so what if we use some more? We have got, elastics. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, if we brought have... some in here just in case. What's this? It's uh, surgical tubing. It's like a giant elastic. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess this is elastic force. So do we do we twist well, here, it we around can... at the bottom there? Well, or? we just wrap it around the throwing arm like this. And... Oh, I see. So we tie yeah. it here. Yeah, we just need a lot more, and then and then we pull this, and it would be. Oh yeah, that would yeah. make a lot more. So we just need a lot more of this elastic. Uh, what is what is this again? Surgical tubing. Surgical tubing. It's like a giant elastic. Fantastic. All right. Goggles on. Goggles on, yes, yes. Here's another fun way you can play with elastic force. Take a milk carton, I prefer Science Max Milk because it's the creamiest. 2% cream, 100% science. Wrap some elastic bands around it with some popsicle sticks on the bottom, sort of like feet. Then, take some clamshell packaging, which wraps just about anything you buy nowadays, and cut out a square or a rectangle. Then, wrap some tape around that square with an elastic in it, 
and put the elastic on the feet of your milk carton. Then wind it around and make sure you go backwards so your paddle wheel boat will go forwards when you put it in the water. And there you go, a paddle wheel boat. Now it is time to max it out. Ahoy, the SS maxed out elastic force paddle wheel boat mattress. I need, I need a, a better name. But I've made a giant paddle wheel boat that will work on elastic force because I've got surgical tubing as my elastics and that's an air mattress. And then I use some lumber to hold it all together. And of course I need a paddle wheel and what better thing to use in a pool than a flutter board. Okay, here we go. So normally you're not allowed to wear your clothes and your shoes in the pool, but I got special permission because of signs. Besides, I'm not worried at all, so I didn't wear my swimming outfit because I figure I can totally do this entire experiment without even getting wet. That is how confident I am. All right, now the tricky part, we'll be getting onto the mattress. Okay, here we go. Ha <laughs> ha, whoa. It's a great name for this. Look, it works great. And I managed to stay totally dry. Huh? Well, almost. Whoa, oh, oh. <laughs> you thought I was going to fall in the pool, but I didn't. Uh oh. My flutter board has, has stopped moving, and I'm, I'm in the middle of the pool. Almost. Yeah. Didn't think this through. No. 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 No, that's not going to work. Maybe I'll... Maybe I'll wait. Our maxed out catapult was working well with the sling we attached to it, but it still didn't make it all the way to the wall. Zach's idea is to attach a bunch of surgical tubing to the cross piece of the catapult. Surgical tubing is pretty much big elastics, so we'll have two places we're getting elastic force from, the rope and the surgical tubing. Hopefully this design is enough to help our catapult fling a pumpkin far enough to hit the castle wall. All right, here we go. Uh, you hold that, I get this. We got our system down now. Okay. Oh. This goes up to there. Okay. Okay. Three, two, one. Uh, nope. <laughs> uh. One, two, three. Uh. Oh. It went too far. We are, that's so good. Oh man. All right. Okay, so all we gotta do is move the catapult back. So you get that side, I'll get this side, and we'll move the catapult. See, now our catapult is too good. We gotta back it away from the castle. All right, let's go again. Aha, pumpkin. Pumpkin. Pulling arm back. Pulling arm back. Uh, grunting. Loading pumpkin. <laughs> Hooking rope on arm. Hooking rope on arm, more grunting. More grunting. Uh, pulling back strongly. One, two, three. Oh, 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 wow. Woo. We're inside the castle. We're still inside the castle. Oh man, it's an excellent shot though. So what do we do, move the catapult back? Yeah. Move the catapult back. What about so here? here. Here we go again. Pumpkin. Pumpkin. Loading arm. Loading arm. All right, you ready? 
You think it's gonna work? We've got we've done every modification we can possibly do. So you think it's gonna work this we time? We did it, it's gonna work. Okay, here we go, I'm excited. All right, ready? Ready. One, two, three. Whoa! Yeah! <laughs> Woohoo! High fives! Well, there you have it. Awesome job. Now we need to throw fingers to see who gets to rebuild the castle, okay? One, two, three! Oh. Thanks very much for joining us. Let's just take a break, I'll rebuild the castle. <laughs> you see, this is exactly how catapults used to work. They'd hit the same part of the wall over and over until they made a big hole, and that would weaken the wall. Fortunately for me, it's really easy to fix. Uh, just put this right in here. Oh, man. <sighs> Greetings, Science Maximites. My name is Phil, and today on Science Max Experiments at Large, we are using mouse traps, but I cannot find my mouse trap, so it's gonna be a little hard to do the experiment unless I have, oh, hey, here they are. Oh yeah, I stored them preset. Why, why would I do that? Okay, well that's, that's fine. Anyway, today we, careful, are going to be using mouse trap. Uh, um, like I said, we are going to be using uh, mouse traps, mouse traps as a form of uh, propulsion. That's the force that makes things go, and we are going to be making a boat go. And what is the thing that's going to make this boat go? A mouse. Uh. Oh, oh, it's not set. Sorry, I'm really jumpy. Anyway, we're going to be using a mouse trap, and don't worry, no mice are going to be harmed in the making of this or any Science Max episode. But mouse traps are really great because they can store energy in the spring. If you see, there's a spring that makes this bar want to snap back, but we can put energy into the spring and store it and then use that energy as it unwinds the spring to propel our boat. But it's a little more complicated than just this, so come on, I'll show you. What we're gonna do is build this. This is the mousetrap boat, and it works like this. I've got the mousetrap, and it's attached to a long arm. That arm has a string on it, and it goes around the paddle wheel, and as the mousetrap unwinds, the paddle wheel spins like that, which pushes the boat forward. Now, it looks kind of complicated, but it's actually quite simple to make, and here's what you need. My mousetrap boat is made with styrofoam, craft sticks, and elastics. You'll also want a pencil, plastic drink caps, a shish kebab skewer, small zip ties, string, and of course, your mousetrap. Now, mousetraps can hurt your fingers, so get an adult to help you when you use it. Start with two pieces of styrofoam. I like to cut mine into this shape, but the only really important thing is that they're the same size. Your paddle wheel is made from a circle of styrofoam with a pencil through the middle, and it will go across like this. To make the paddle wheel, I use cut pieces of craft stick, or they can be plastic, and make some cuts and then put them in like this, and that is what will make your paddles on the paddle wheel, because that's the wheel and that's the paddle. Paddle wheel, <laughs> that's why they call it that. Stick drink caps to the ends of the pencil after sticking it through the styrofoam. I like to use a few craft sticks and elastics to help give the styrofoam strength. Next is the mouse trap, which you want to glue down to a frame of four craft sticks. Attach the frame to the boat with elastics, then attach the shish kebab skewer or a pencil to the mouse trap with zip ties. I like to put some craft sticks on the end to make it easier to tie the string to it. Wrap the other end around the paddle wheel pencil, and remember you need enough string so that your stick can lie flat. Okay, let's try it out. Wind up the paddle wheel. This'll be a little hard as the spring will pull back, but that's where you're storing the energy. And when it's wound up, put it in the water and let it go. The paddle wheel turns because the mouse trap is transferring energy that we put in earlier, and it goes all the way. We stored the energy in the tension of the spring. Now that tension is pulling the mouse trap, the stick, and the string, which turns the paddle wheel and makes the boat go. Mouse trap powered boat! If you want more detailed instructions or other designs, look up mouse trap boat. And there you have it, the mouse trap powered paddle wheel boat. And this is what we're going to max out today. Come on. All right, time to pick an expert and go off to max it out. Careful, okay, let's see here. And 
Uh-huh. Who to pick? But, ah! Michaela from the Ontario Science Center. She'd be perfect. All right. Come on. Water again. Oh well, at least maybe Michaela made it. Ah! Oh, Michaela! Whoa, no. Are you okay? Are we still fixing the portal? Yeah, I oh, needed to tweak it just a little bit. It was a, <laughs> it's a little off again. Anyway, great to see you, Michaela, from the Ontario Science Center. You're gonna help me match up the mousetrap boat. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, where's the boat? I, yeah, I don't have it. it. I thought it was gonna come through the portal. Um, it could be anywhere, really. I mean, just... <laughs> what? Oh, here it is. Okay, good. So here is the mousetrap boat. Check it out. So, got a mousetrap here, right? And you wind up the paddle wheel. And it goes! Yeah, right on. Awesome. So, what do you think we should do in order to max this out? Uh, well, first idea, I'm just thinking more mousetraps. More mousetraps. So, we just make a boat and it has like 10 mousetraps on it. At least. Okay, great. Actually, I had mousetraps. I had mousetraps coming through the portal as oh, well. Oh, okay. Oh. Okay. Okay, we're all right. Okay, so now we've got the mousetraps. We can start building. <laughs> Let's go collect them carefully, though. I don't know if they're... <laughs> Initial thrust! Or oh, constant thrust! <laughs> <laughs> What's the difference? It's all about power! <laughs> Uh-oh. Paper airplane initial thrust. It gets all... It gets all of it. It gets all of its thrust from my throw. <laughs> Initial thrust. If you want constant thrust, you have to take the thrust with you, like this. There's a lot of cats in here. Initial thrust. Initial thrust. Initial thrust. All the energy is put into the beginning of the. All the energy is put into the beginning. If you want constant thrust, then the thing has to produce power while it's moving. Wind up car, constant thrust. Actual car? Yeah, that's constant thrust because you have an engine. Of course, not this car. This is this is a toy car. But but you know what I mean. Check out this fishing rod, and on it I have a lure with a hook. Now watch this. I cast it out, initial thrust, but then I use the reel and start winding it back in. Constant thrust, huh? Huh? Two thrusts in one. And now you know the difference between initial thrust and constant thrust. Hey! Huh, I caught a fish! Hey, hey! Oh, oh. Easy, kitty. Nice kitties. Easy, Ramona! <laughs> Michaela and I are maxing out a mouse trap boat. We built a larger version with 10 mouse traps all in a line. So it looks pretty good. I think we're ready, right? Yeah, I think so. We've got a whole bunch of mouse traps. Should we, should yeah. we wind it up and see right. what, what happens? Let's do it. Mm -hmm. I think this is going to go pretty well. What do you think of that stick? Is that going to bend too much? Is that going to snap? Or... It's pretty flexible. I mean, I think we're okay. I think we just keep going and, yeah. until it, it breaks. Ooh. Oh. Now it's starting to look very oh, fast. Man. Yeah, <laughs> like it looks like a speedboat. Okay, ready? Go. <laughs> hmm. Well, um, positive, it is working. It's not gonna win any speedboat <laughs> It is not, not gonna win any races at all. But it's totally working. The mousetraps, they're pulling on the string. The string is making the paddle wheel turn. Just not much. I would have thought this many mousetraps would be a little bit more effective. Yeah, it looks like we're going for, for distance over power things. See, oh, right, using because... A lever here. That's a lot of distance for this to travel. Small amount have... of force over a much longer distance, that's how a lever yeah. works. Exactly. So we slide the rope down further on the stick, then we would get more force, and it just wouldn't go as long. Okay, so why don't we try that? Wrapping like that. Nice. All right, once nice. again. Trial two. Yeah. Okay. okay, ready? Ready, set, go! Ah! Oh. Hey, that was better than last. Oh, now it's picking up. Yeah, that's really working. Oh, oh, careful. Oh, look out! <laughs> oh, no. So, good. It's good. Hey. It's not 
Great. Not yet. <laughs> yeah, we right? Didn't. How do we make it better? What do you think? Well, I was thinking, what if we try to reduce the friction? Remember that other boat we tried? Uh, here it is. Oh, yeah. The little one, you mean? Yeah, the little one. See, look at this one. It has a pontoon style. Do you see how um, we have it floating on these two surfaces? Yeah. So very little is actually touching the water. Whereas oh. this one, we have a giant hull that's going to drag the water and slow our boat down. So it's, it's sort of like the difference between, like, like pushing a whole bunch of water like that and and pushing the water like that. Yeah, we want very little resistance for our boat. So little resistance with a couple things that just stick down like that. A lot of resistance when we have big, flat, big, like <laughs> exactly. that. So we completely rebuilt this boat. Shall we do it? Yeah, let's do it. Uh, our tools floated away again. Oh. Race ya. <laughs> Our maxed out mousetrap boat isn't the only way to give a boat propulsion. Let's look at another way using a balloon. Let's make a balloon powered boat. All you need for that is something to be your boat and a balloon. Then you attach them together. Actually, the best way to do it is use a straw and attach the balloon to the straw using an elastic band. And then you attach it to your boat using more elastic bands, just like this. I put a nice tape top on the boat to make it look awesome. And I also put a little bit of a riser here using just anything plastic to keep the straw nice and straight because the question is, will our balloon powered boat work better if it's pushing in the air or if it's pushing in the water? Well, let's do a science experiment and find out. First version in the air. <laughs> Oh, almost all the way. Now let's try it with the straw like this so it pushes into the water. Whoa! It works so much better. Why? Because water is denser than air. The air coming out of the straw has to push against something to make the boat move. Water has more mass than air, so pushing against water has a better result. Now, let's max it out. This is an air compressor. Well, actually, that is the air compressor. You see, the engine here pushes air into this tank, which works sort of like the balloon. And then it goes out this long hose, which sort of works like a straw. So let's make a maxed out air powered boat. Ready? Just like the small boat, pushing against the air doesn't produce much thrust. Huh, not so great. But now let's put it in the water. Pushing against the water gives me much more thrust because water is more dense than air. <laughs> Maxed out air powered boat! Maxed out air powered boat! Yeah! Whoa. That's, that's not me. Michaela and I are maxing out the mouse trap boat. Ten mouse traps didn't seem to make our boat go very fast, but moving the string down our lever arm helped, and now we want to redesign the hull so it has less friction with the water. Ah, <laughs> check it out! This is the ultimate mouse trap boat. We got ten mouse traps here. We got our long arm. We have it attached at the right point of the lever, we think, and then we've got two, two paddle wheels at the back and. Pontoons. Yes. Yeah, so what I do you think, Kayla? this Michaela? thing is set. It's gonna be awesome? Yep. Okay, ready? Ready? Let's test it. Oh, oh it's working! Hey, it's working! It's picking up speed! Yes? Wow! Whoa, mousetrap boat. I mean, it's good. It's good. It's not Science Max good. Yeah. Uh, we were hoping it would go faster. Faster no. or... No, pretty much just faster. <laughs> yeah, okay. Obviously, okay. we need to store more energy that will make the paddle wheels uh, go faster, right? Yeah, so we just have to think about it, right? Like, what's stronger than a mouse trap? Well, ten mouse traps. That's why we have ten <laughs> mouse traps, Michaela. Okay, what's what's stronger than ten mouse traps? Eleven mouse traps. <laughs> like, if we just keep going, okay, and it's just gonna get super trap. wide, we have a thousand mouse trap wide. What's, what's, enough what? with the mouse traps. Have you ever seen like a rat trap? No. They're huge. Well, hold on. I can just get one from the portal. One rat trap coming up. Oh. Okay, okay, came from. All right, well that's fine. And whoa! Wow! Yeah, look at that, that is a lot bigger. Huge okay, so snap difference. yours. Is, All right, is it ready? No strap. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's terrifying. <laughs> So that's a lot more power. Yeah, a lot of force. Uh, so tell you what, we have a little mousetrap boat. Why don't we build a little single rat trap powered boat and we'll race them 
and we'll just see the difference in, in power from one rat trap to one master. I like that. We'll do a prototype before we make a big one. Yeah, okay, come on, let's go. So, we built a rat trap boat to race the mouse trap boat. And then Michaela and I got a little competitive. Check out the rat trap boat. No, oh, check out the mouse trap boat. Mouse trap boat is better because. <laughs> yeah, rat trap boat is better. It's got bigger springs, more potential energy stored in here. And, and mouse trap boat has less potential energy and less springs, but he's got more heart and he really wants to win. Hey, yeah, I'll tell you what, Phil. Loser jumps in the pool. What? Oh, um, uh, okay. Sure, let's do it. Okay, ready? Go! So, as you may have guessed, the rat trap boat has a lot more potential energy that can be stored in the spring. Okay, so, rat trap boat is clearly better than the mouse trap boat. We make the boat the same way, yeah. but we use rat traps instead of mouse traps. What do you say? <laughs> Love it. Okay, let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah. Wait a second, Phil. What? Ferris Fairy, gonna jump in the pool. Okay, fine. Here you go. Hold this. <laughs> Inertia. What is it? Well, it's directly related to Newton's first law of motion. An object in motion tends to stay in motion, an object at rest tends to stay at rest. Let's do an experiment. Here is an object. Right now, it's at rest. You might think that means it has no inertia, but that's not true. Inertia just means an object's tendency to keep doing what it is doing. Right now, it's doing nothing. But if I wanted to overcome its inertia, I would have to put energy in. And now that I have, it is moving on its own. It has inertia. If I wanted to stop it, I would have to overcome its inertia, its tendency to keep moving. There. I went exactly that far. Now, let's max it out. I'm adding uh, uh, these weights to the cart. Now it has a lot more mass which means it has a lot more inertia and its tendency to do nothing. But this time it has a lot more inertia. If I wanted to get it going the same speed as before, I'd have to put in a lot more effort. There, now it's going the same speed as before, but now it has way more inertia, so stopping it will be harder. So there you go, inertia, a thing's tendency to stay moving or stay still, and the more mass, the more inertia. <sighs> Dear Phil, I can't believe you did a whole episode on boat propulsion and you didn't use the greatest thing out there for making a boat move, a propeller. Sincerely, a fan. Well, let's talk about propellers. Oh. Good thing this is fan mail. <laughs> Get it? Because it's a fan? Anyway. A fan pushes air just like a boat propeller pushes water. They're both fluids and they behave in the same way. Now, if you look closely at a fan, it's curved on the blades. The air or water is caught under at this side and then it's pushed out on the curve to make it go that way. And the faster it spins, the better it works. Now this is a propeller powered boat. And what you do is wind up the propeller. I have an elastic band here to store the amount of energy I put in. And then you put it in the water, the propeller spins and the boat goes forwards. It's being propelled by the propeller. <laughs> That's why you call it that. Awesome, right? Well, now we'll max it out. This is a drill. It spins. And this is a propeller. And when you put it in the water and spin it, it provides thrust. So let's try it out. Whoa! Remember not to try this at home. I am a trained professional. This is a very small propeller. Let's compare. This, th this is a super maxed out propeller. Whoa, okay, let's try it out. Whoa! The larger a propeller is, the more energy you need to turn it and the more propulsion you get out. 
Michaela and I are maxing out the mouse trap boat. Well, actually, we can't call it a mouse trap boat anymore because now we're using rat traps. <laughs> <laughs> the design is the same as our 10 mouse trap boat. Rat trap boat! Rat trap boat! Rat trap boat! It's the super most rat trap boat ever! We wind it up and try it out. Okay, ready? Go! It worked great. The reason is because this boat was storing a lot more energy in the spring tension. More energy means more propulsion. So much, we couldn't even catch it. Let's do it again. <laughs> Greetings, Science Maximites. My name is Phil, and welcome to Science Max Experiments at Large. Today, we're going to be looking at air pressure and friction and simple machines like levers, pulleys, and gears. We're going to look at some rotational energy, um, some spring tension, <laughs> and gravity. We need all those things because we're building Rube Goldberg machines. Rube Goldberg machines. Rube Goldberg machines. Rube Goldberg machines. Machines. Rube Goldberg, you heard me say Rube Goldberg machine? Okay, we got that part? Okay, good. Rube Goldberg was a cartoonist who came up with the idea of having a simple task done by a machine that was extremely complicated. There are Rube Goldberg competitions all over the world, and there's only a few rules. First, a human can only touch it once by starting the whole thing off, and then the machine has to work all on its own. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Phil, what's the science behind a Rube Goldberg machine? Well, it's all about changing energy. Remember, you start the whole thing off with just a little push, but if you want the machine to keep going and going and going, you have to come up with clever ways to add more energy to the system so you've got more energy to keep the machine going. So check this out. A bunch of stacked dominoes, which will start a chain reaction that leads to this mouse trap, which has all of its energy stored in the spring tension, which will release the ball. Bing! Check this one out. It's a bunch of pulleys, and there's a rope that goes up and down and up, attached to this lever where there's a ball, and there's a big heavy weight here. And when the weight gets knocked off the table, the ball falls into the hole and then goes down the tube, and so on. Check this one out. Here's a great way to change the direction of something. Say the ball falls on this lever. Well, it's weighted on this end, but then the weight falls off, and the ball goes this way. <laughs> and, uh-oh, uh, the portal turned on. Uh, I gotta pick an expert. Okay. Hold on a second. Uh, 10 seconds before the portal resets. Ah, Sonia from the Ontario Science Center. Perfect. And there we go. Tons of time. Three, two, one. Oh. Sonia. Hey. I portaled in three blocks away. I had to run here. Okay. You're here now? Yeah, I didn't Great. put the coordinates in when I left. Hey, anyway. It's okay, it's okay. Breathe. Sonia from the Ontario Science Center. I'm glad you're here. Because nice. we are going to build a Rube Goldberg machine. Really? Yeah. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. Yeah? Yeah. I'm excited too. Check it out. This giant room, we, I've never done anything with it. So why don't we build a giant machine in here? Why right? not? Okay, so here's the rules. The Rube Goldberg machine has to start with one simple thing, right? Yep. So we're going to start with this marble. And yep. we send it on its way. And then a whole bunch of stuff happens. And at the end, we press that button. That button? Yeah. What What does it do? I've never used it before, but when we hit that button, we get cake. Cake? A cake will portal in and we'll have cake. Oh my goodness, can we get chocolate cake? We can totally have chocolate cake. All right, now I'm really, really excited. Okay, so can I start? Absolutely. Great, because I saw some stuff over here. Okay. This is a pendulum. It's a weight that swings. It swings back and forth. Pendulums are pretty simple. It, it swings back and forth. Predicting the path of a pendulum, pretty simple. It's gonna swing back and forth. But wait, as I make it so much more complex by adding a pendulum. Now I've got a pendulum down here, and that one swings back and forth, and I've got a pendulum up here that swings back and forth. What will happen to this part of the pendulum when I let it go? Can you predict? Let's find out. This is a double pendulum, and predicting the path of a double pendulum is really difficult. It's still simple physics, but because there's a moving part attached to a moving part, it makes it way more complex. So, the question is, can we max it out even more? Of course we can. These are chaos pendulums. This one's a lever, and it's got another lever on the end. 
Whoa, and this one here is a perfectly balanced lever and it's got a pendulum on either side. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Scientists and engineers have always said that the more moving parts something has, the more complex they are. Science. Sonia and I are taking turns building our Rube Goldberg machine. The first section was my turn and I explained it to Sonia. Right here, we have what is known as a ramp. Ooh, yeah, I know you know Fancy. That. Right, so we put a marble on the ramp that rolls along this thing into what is known as a pylon. And then we've got these guys right here, which are dominoes. And when that falls off the table, it'll pull on the string, mm -hmm. and then it's attached to this. Now, this is the release mechanism, so when that uh, string gets pulled, it will let go, and it will fire this, which is a trebuchet. All right, should, should we test it out? Absolutely, you Can wanna I try it? it? Yeah, please, yeah. okay. Okay, three, two, one. Wait. Hmm. hmm. The, didn't 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 go. The, the why didn't? Well, the domino doesn't seem to be heavy enough to make this contraption fire. You know what, Phil? What? I have an idea. Oh yeah? Maxed out dominoes. Maxed out dominoes. I love that idea. Yeah. Uh, why are they maxed out? Do they do they glow in the dark? We'll see. Do they produce electricity? We'll see. Do they talk to animals? We will do see. Do they dissolve in water? Oh, maxed out domino. That's what I'm talking about. These are very maxed out. Okay, so, so we now. We started yeah. off with this domino. Uh huh. Then we went bigger. Yeah. Bigger, yeah. bigger, 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 bigger. And we went to the biggest. Right. And this is where we're going to get the most weight, which is going to trigger it and release. Ha ha. Woohoo. Here we go. Three, two, one. Here we go. Ah. The one thing to remember about Rube Goldberg machines is they never work perfectly every time. <laughs> Didn't, didn't, didn't go. But we tweaked it and adjusted things, and then... Here we go. Three, two, one. Whoa. Right. Whoa. Oh. That was pretty far. Yeah, check this out. Whoa. Whoa. Okay, so nice. now, now that we've got the trebuchet firing, yep. the ball is going over there. Mm -hmm. We need to get the ball going over here yeah. to... The cake button. Cake button. I can't wait for the cake. So I have an idea. Come on. Okay. No, wait. Changing direction stuff is all wrong. Uh, okay. <laughs> now we're going to talk about tension. What's tension? One more than nine shin. Get it? Because tension <laughs> and nine shin. That's okay. I'll, um, because I. Tension is the force that we usually talk about when we think about pulling a rope or a chain or something like that, because you know the old expression, you can't push a rope. But today we are gonna push a rope. I have a rope right here, and I'm going to push it using another force called flexion. I've got some pieces of plastic here, and they bend or flex, and when they do, they want to spring back, but I'm gonna prevent them from springing back by putting them in between these knots. Huh? And look, the rope now stays up. And I take another piece and I stick it on this knot and then I bend it all the way. This is not terrifying. Really, it's not terrifying at all. Oh, okay, good. And then I take this piece and I put it here and I bend it around and... <gasps> So now we have a rope that's being pushed and we're defying gravity and we're making a cool art sculpture. All right, one more here. Ooh, okay, here we go. And, and, flexing. And, whoa. I've pushed a rope, defied gravity, and made a cool art sculpture. Okay, well, I guess technically I haven't really pushed the rope because we're still pulling from each knot. And I guess I haven't really defied gravity because that one's sitting on the table and all the others are sitting on top of that. But you can't argue that I made a cool art sculpture. Ha <laughs> ha! Art! I mean, science! Sonia and I are maxing out a Rube Goldberg machine. The first part worked pretty well, and now we need to change the ball's direction. This is a trebuchet. 
Yeah. Trebuchet fires the ball, right? Yeah. Right now, I want to tell you the story of the ball. First, it goes through this fancy film of tin foil. Uh, aluminum foil? Right, aluminum foil, because it's, yeah, you're right, it's made of aluminum. It enters this large receptacle. Uh, a garbage can? A gar you also could be called a garbage can. It falls into this conular, conular um, device. A uh, funnel? A funnel, yes, you could call it a funnel. And then it enters the changeo direction o right. which is a lever. There's a weight on that end, then it falls off, then the ball goes this way. Um, bell? Or that way. The one thing you need most of all when making a Rube Goldberg machine is patience. Ball goes in the funnel. Knocks that off, changes direction, and then it goes this way. Okay. And that's all I got so far. So, not bad. Yeah. But we really want to get closer to that way. Right, because that's the button that gives us cake. How about we use some chemical energy for this? Ooh, chemical energy. I have an idea for this one. Let me go get go it. Go for it. This is my idea. Okay. The ball's actually gonna roll down the tube. Oh, oh. yeah, because this is a rat trap, right? Yeah. Which is like bigger than a mouse trap. And then it's gonna hit it. Yeah. <laughs> Nice. Ooh, so this flips around. Exactly. And what's this? That is something called an antacid tablet. Some water. And exactly. the antacid and the water react. Oh! It blew. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to test it out? Sure, can I? OK. OK, ball comes through this, goes down there, comes out of this, and on the ramp. Onto the trap, and... Oh. Ah, so then nice. it fires up <laughs> yep. and hits something else yeah. and something, 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 button cake. Hmm, so we got a lot of different energies, but you know what one we're missing? What? Is electrical energy. Yeah, you're actually right. Uh, I've got a great idea, hold on, hold on. All right, let's see what he comes up with. <laughs> this is a chain of beads and this is a uh, glass. Now, if I was to drop the chain of beads, what'll happen? It will fall. Yes, that's right. It'll fall because of gravity. But watch this. This side goes up. Why? Because of gravity. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Why does one side go up because of gravity? Well, it gets a little complicated, but I can explain. Um, but I think I should... I'll have to put the beads back in the glass. Okay, so what's going on? Well, when this part of the chain starts falling out, it gets longer and longer, and it has more mass than this side of the chain. And if it has more mass, then it has more inertia. And when it starts yanking out very hard, this side of the chain gets yanked up out of the glass very quickly. And when it gets yanked up hard, it flies into the air. But then, of course, the direction has to change, so it goes around a curve and then goes back down. Because of the speed that it's going, that curve starts lifting up over the top of the glass. And that's how it works. There's a big difference in energy because this chain falls far. I try it from here, and it doesn't work as well. Why? Because the drop from here to here isn't as big. You want lots of force acting on the falling chain, which means the higher you do it from, the better it works. So maybe we should max it out. Yeah. Oh, wait, we should wait for it to stop. And now let's max it out. This is a really long chain, and this is a really long drop. Let's see what happens. Whoa! <laughs> Look at that. Whoa! Super maxed out! Science! Tony and I have used potential energy, the lever, and chemical energy. But you know what one we're missing? What? Is electrical energy. Electromagnetism. So watch. The chemical rockets, which we've had from before, they'll fire up, they'll hit the underside of this tray. The marbles will fall and flick this switch. See that sledgehammer? Uh -huh. This is an electromagnet, and it will attract the, the metal in the sledgehammer. Watch this, ready? There. there. Magnetized. Electromagnetism. Now, when the marbles fall, it'll turn the electromagnet off, and the hammer will fall. Oh, that's pretty cool, actually. Right? Hey, so let's, let's try it. Here's something we didn't know. Predicting the flight path of an antacid rocket canister is almost impossible. We had them aim the same way every time. But we stuck with it 
and being patient is key, and eventually, <laughs> eventually, it worked. The chemical rockets fire, and they hit the tray. That's pretty cool. Yeah, so now we just need hammer hit something and then something, 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 button, cake. I have an idea. All right. Cake, any minute now. This is a basketball. It bounces. This is a golf ball. It bounces but it never bounces as high as where I dropped it from. But watch as I put the golf ball on top of the basketball. Whoa! Why does the golf ball bounce higher than where I dropped it from? How is this possible? I only bounce the golf ball from one meter high. So what's going on? Well, as the basketball hits the ground, it compresses, storing the potential energy of its bounce, about to give that energy back as it bounces up again. But this energy works as a springboard for the golf ball. And since the golf ball has a lot less mass than the basketball, the upwards kinetic energy of the basketball is given to the golf ball. So, let's max it out. Ball, on a ball, on a ball. Three ball bounce. Ball, on a ball, on a ball, on a ball. Quadruple ball bounce. Oh, oh. Oh. No, wait. Turns out getting four balls to drop straight down on top of each other is pretty difficult. So, we know the mass of the ball is important. Why don't we max it out in a different way? This is a Swiss ball for exercising. It has a lot more mass than a golf ball. So let's try it out. There you go. The transfer of energy between balls. A great way to lose golf balls. Sonia has added one more step to our Rube Goldberg machine, a stomp rocket. It's a hammer rocket. Exactly. Like so that. what's going to happen is the hammer is going to hit our bottle, which right. is going to release all that air that's built up inside of it. It's going to hit that button. Wait, 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 wait. The rocket hits the button. And then we get some... Cake! 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 Oh, yeah, so this is it. it. This so we're done it. the Rube Goldberg machine uh -huh. with this last step. Okay. Do you want to do it? I think we should do it. Ready? Ready? Three, two, one. Let's pause here just before the cake portals in and recap the science. A marble on top of this ramp has potential energy. As it rolls down, that changes to kinetic energy, which transfers to some stacked dominoes. They fall in a chain reaction, finally causing bigger and bigger dominoes to fall, giving the last domino enough mass to pull a string, attach through some pulleys to a quick release on a trebuchet. Now, a trebuchet is a first-class lever with a weight on one side and a sling and a ball on the other. If the weight falls, the sling releases the ball at the right moment and it sails through the air. It's caught in a garbage can and changes directions on a few ramps and another lever as a teeter-totter. Finally, it falls onto a rat trap, which has more energy stored in the tension of the spring. The rat trap smacks another lever, which flips around, turning over some antacid rockets. This allows the antacid to mix with the water and start a chemical reaction that produces carbon dioxide which eventually builds up enough pressure to fire the container to another lever, which tips, dropping some marbles on a string attached to a switch. That turns off the electricity to our electromagnet. And when an electromagnet doesn't have electricity, it stops being a magnet. So our sledgehammer starts to fall. Now our sledgehammer is heavy, so it has both mass and speed when it hits this plastic bottle. All that
that inertia crushes the bottle, reducing its volume. The air gets put under pressure and pushes out through a tube, which takes our stomp rocket with it. The stomp rocket flies through the air and hits our cake button, which then portals in some cake! Uh-oh. Uh... Uh... Huh. Guess we really didn't think that through, huh? The cake should have laid me landed on a table or table something. Table would have been nice. There you go, Science Max, experiments at large, Rube Goldberg machine. Are you sure you don't want some of this cake? No, let's let's. But let's go. but let's go. Uh, 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 greetings, Science Maximites. My name is Phil, and today we're talking about friction. I didn't slide. Take two. I can't. I'm still not. Oh, I I know, I know, I got it. Take three. Well, socks don't work any better. Take 15. <laughs> 34. Take 36. I don't know why I thought that would work. Take 52. I'm Phil, and today we're talking about friction! <laughs> Okay. Oh, <laughs> friction! We did it! We got it, everybody! How many takes was that? Oh. Well, still, we got it. Good work. <laughs> As you may have already guessed, today is about friction. And here's a really easy friction experiment you can do at home. All you need is a piece of wood. You don't need the frame, and you don't have to uh, do anything fancy to it. Just put one end up on a couch or a coffee table and make a nice ramp. Then you want something to slide down that ramp. And I like to use a piece of wood. Now, check it out. Wood ramp, wood block. The friction is so much that the wood slides to there. Now what I like to do is take a little flag and mark the results. Recording the results is good science. Now here's where it gets fun. Get another surface and attach it to the wood, like carpet and wood. Let's see how far this goes. Hmm, not as good. All right, record the results. Cardboard. Ooh, nicely done, cardboard. Foam. And this wood has been waxed, like on a floor wax, which makes it nice and slippery. Let's see how that does. Ooh. And now the ultimate Ice attached to wood. This is actually harder to do than I thought. All right, let's try it out. Ice, the clear winner. Not a big surprise right there. And get this, once you've done all of that, you can change the surface of the ramp. You can go to waxed wood, carpet, boom. Cardboard, but, and, and well, yeah, you get the idea. Record all the results, compare them, and there you go. Friction ramp experiment. And that's what we're gonna be maxing out today. So come on, let's go. Check it out, I've improved the portal interface. Watch this. <gasps> yeah, and then I can scroll through experts, and oh, this is gonna be fun. And I've got my coordinates right there. Oh. Um, that's never happened. Okay. Hey, Sarah. Oh, hey, good to see you again. Good to see you too, Sarah. From Mad Science, you're gonna help me max out friction. Yeah, friction. What do you think of my max out friction room? It's amazing, it's so wonderful. So how are we gonna max out friction today? In the lab, I had a ramp, and I had um, stuff with different surfaces on it. Oh, that's so cool. It's too bad you don't have it here. We could totally test that out. <laughs> I can bring it here. Awesome. I have a new app on my phone that talks to the portal. And let's see. And, ah, yeah. Huh. That's not what I... Oh, hold on, hold on. OK, there we go. And... Whoa. Uh, well, I can do this. I just... Um, it needs an update. Yeah. That's what the... Yeah! Oh, there we there go. It is. Okay. Perfect. So here we go! Amazing! The friction ramp, it's pretty simple. You just take, um, I've got blocks of wood with different surfaces. Amazing! And then you just slide them down the ramp. All right. So cool. Yeah, so what if, um, to max it out, what if this is us? We're a block of wood? No, I mean like we 
are on the block of wood, oh. and then we can tr try changing the bottom. I guess a block of wood isn't the right thing to use, though. Right, yeah. Maybe we could use like a, like a sled. Oh, yeah, OK, yeah. like a, right, uh, like a snow sled. Mm. That's a great idea. OK, so yeah. we'll tell you what. I will portal in a sled for are us. Are you sure you want to portal it in? I'm sure. Just, okay. stand, just stand back, okay. though. OK. Ha! Ah, there we go. Max out friction slide! You ready, Sarah? Yeah. Okay, here we go. Right. Sarah and I pushed each other around on the sled, which was fun, <laughs> but it was also tiring. It's uh, it's pretty hard. This is a uh, my turn, my turn. All right. Oh, yeah. Whoa, friction! Yeah, friction! Yeah, yeah, friction! But we soon realized it'd be pretty hard to measure how much friction there was. You know how hard you were pushing? Like, I had no idea how hard I was pushing. A lot, but that doesn't really help in science terms. So exactly. what do we do? Well, with your first experiment, you used a ramp. Could we maybe put a ramp up in here? In here? In here, yeah. I guess. Uh... Then we can measure also how far we go so we know how much friction is being used. Right, so we have our control, and then we have all the, just like the blocks. Exactly, just like the blocks. OK, great. So we'll get the ramp, we'll get a bunch of wood, right. yes. we'll get some tools. Yeah. The case of the missing friction! It was rough all over in the big city. My toughest case yet, and I felt like I was getting nowhere. Someone stole all the city's friction. And it was my job to find out who and get it back. But after a week, I was no closer to solving the case. It was hard to get anything done now that there was no friction. Uptown to downtown, people were sliding all over with no way to stop themselves. It was chaos. Chaos, I tell you. But if there was any detective that could solve the case, it was me. <laughs> but it's like my grandma always said, it's tough to follow leads if you can't sit in your chair. <laughs> Nothing stays put in a city without friction. And you never appreciate something till it's gone. The phone rang. Sure, I wanted to answer it, but it slipped through my grasp just like this case. The mayor was on the line. He wanted to know if I'd made any progress. But I felt I was going in circles. I, I'm a little... I'm gonna have to call you back, Mr. Mayor. Without friction, you couldn't do very much at all. It was going to be my toughest case yet. Sounds good. Sarah and I are maxing out a friction ramp. Step one, make a giant ramp. There, are we done? Hey, I think so. We're done. But it proved a bit hard to lift up to the second floor. Fortunately, Sarah had an idea. Maybe we could use this crane. We use the crane! Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've got a five-ton crane at Science Max headquarters. Good thinking, Sarah. So we rigged it up and tried it out. The bonus was we could make the ramp any angle we wanted. OK, time to get my helmet, because don't go any higher than that, because I don't have my helmet. And then we will start sliding down. All friction right, room! Friction. I got on the slide, and Sarah lifted it up until I started moving. Ah! <laughs> and that allowed us to record our results. We're at two meters. Two, two meters. meters recorded. <laughs> First recording done, All now right. we switch it up. We tried it again with Sarah on the slide to see if she slid at the same height. And she did. Yeah. <laughs> now we have a way to record the results. The plastic sled went down the ramp at this height. Things with more friction will mean the mark is higher, and less friction will mean the mark is lower. So then, we tried it with... Cardboard! <laughs> cardboard! What did we get? And it was? A little over two meters. Meaning? Cardboard is a little bit less slippy than the plastic of the sled. All right. Ready for carpet sled? Good to go. Here we go. <laughs> oh, past two meters. Right. Oh, almost three. Here we go, here we go. Carpet had even more. Oh my gosh, we're going to the side. Whoa. <laughs> that was so cool. <laughs> that was exactly three. Then we tried. Boom. Coming up on two meters. Any 
And just like the wood block, the foam didn't slide at all. What if I, like, do this and then I slide? <laughs> <laughs> Right, so, um, friction sled, uh, on foam, highest friction of all of the materials. Oh, hello there. I, whoa, uh, here's a fun science experiment you can do with science and friction together. Take two books. Put them on top of each other and pull them apart. Ooh, not too much friction. But if you take the books and you interleave some of the pages, maybe three or four parts, and try it again, pull them apart, they're a little harder to pull apart. That's because the friction for more pages touching each other actually starts to add up. So what if we were to take two books with a lot of pages and very carefully and meticulously take each page individually, one at a time, and overlay each one and go back and forth. These are two books completely shuffled together. The elastic band is actually just to hold the covers together. All right. So now the friction between all of these pages, when I try to pull it apart, makes it pretty much impossible. Now, there's two things going on here. First of all, when you start to pull the books apart, the pages start to stick together because they squeeze together because you're pulling and they're squeezing. And the fact that there's so many pages sticking together, the friction builds up to a degree that is actually very impressive. But don't take my word for it. Let's max it out. Here is another two books, elastic just to hold the covers. This one clamped to the wall, and I'm gonna pull this one. <laughs> Science! Still don't believe me? Well, let's max it out some more. Two books, all the pages layered together, held together only by friction, suspended over a giant bat of slime. Now, <laughs> let's see how much faith I have in science. Hmm? <laughs> Friction! Yeah! Okay! Okay, oh no! Okay, now to get down. Okay, hold on. And then... <laughs> Science! <laughs> that was close. Sarah and I have used our maxed out friction ramp and compared the regular sled to cardboard and foam. What's next? We've waxed the bottom of this sled and we're gonna try a wax sled next. Wax sled! All right, here we go. All right. One meter. Oh boy. 1.5 meters. Whoa! Oh. Wax sled! Slipperiest yet, yeah. only 1.5 meters. That's awesome. Do we have anything that's more slippery? Yeah, we do. We have ice sled. Are you ready to try it out? So ready to try it out. Okay, let's do it. All right. And there we Whoa. go. Whoa. Oh my God. <laughs> Look how far you went. <laughs> that was so cool. And only 1.25 meters. Least amount of friction. Ice wins. So I think we should do something else to max this out, though. Maybe bringing it up a little bit more and yeah, know, using I, something with less friction. Wait, I have an idea. Um, yeah, OK, come with okay. me. This is a climbing frog. Why does he climb? Because of science. I pull on this rope, and then I pull on that rope, and I pull on that rope, and that rope, and he climbs up the ropes. And why? Well, because of friction. The secret is two straws. The straws are pointed away from each other at the bottom. This allows it to climb thanks to friction. Take a closer look. When I pull on one string, it pulls straight, which makes the frog pivot. That string slips through the straw because there's not a lot of friction. But there's lots of friction on the other side because of the angle. 
So one side of the string goes down, which makes the other go up, which means the frog goes up with it. All thanks to friction. So now, let's max it out. This is a super maxed out uh, climbing frog. Just like the small version, I have a rope going through two tubes. I pull on one rope and the other holds on by friction. Then I switch. And it does work. It's just a lot harder to pull on the ropes. Uh, but it totally works. Whoa, guess what? Right there, and then this one, and then that one, and then that one. Yeah! <laughs> a giant climbing frog! <laughs> <laughs> All because of friction. Here's another way to defy gravity using friction. Get a plastic water bottle and fill it with rice. Take two. So get a plastic water bottle and fill it with rice using a funnel. Then take a shish kebab skewer and stick it into the bottle and nothing happens. But if you tap the bottle down, the rice starts to pack in a little bit better. See how the level of rice is lower? Which means you can add more rice. Pack it down even more. And you can even use something the same diameter as the mouth of the bottle, like say a highlighter. And make sure all the rice is as packed in as you can get it there. Now the rice is really packed in there. And when I stick the shish kebab skewer in, the friction between the pieces of rice and this wood is enough to lift the bottle using nothing but friction. Now, let's max it out. I filled this 20 liter water cooler jug full of rice and it's really, it's really heavy. I wanted to see if I could lift it using nothing but friction and this dowel, which is just a round piece of wood. All right, here we go. Ah, <laughs> science! I'd max it out even more, but I don't think I could lift anymore. It's okay, I can just fit. Um. Newton's first law in 60 seconds. Newton's first law says an object in motion tends to stay in motion. So, why don't they? See, if I was to throw this, it doesn't stay in motion, it doesn't keep going, it slows down and falls to the ground. Well, the whole law states an object in motion tends to stay in motion until an external force acts upon it. So what forces are acting upon this? Well, gravity for one, pulling it down towards the ground, and friction, specifically air friction, slowing this down and making it stop. Now, if you were to have something very light with a lot of surface area, it would really be affected by air friction. You wouldn't be able to throw it very far at all, no matter how hard you tried. So there you go. Newton's first law, an object in motion tends to stay in motion unless it's affected by an external force such as friction, like air friction. So there you go. Sarah and I have recorded a lot of results on our ramp by raising it till we started to slide. Here we go! Now we've decided to raise the ramp to the highest point and see how far we can go using some low friction things, like a wheeled cart. I've made a double bike cart. Wheels are great for moving. They have rolling friction. Ready? Which is different from sliding friction. Whoa! boxes back there. That was it. We went really far. Total fun. Let's try something else. So what are we going to do next? Now we're going to do the frictionless this thing that we have at Science Max Headquarters, a hover disc. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. Where did you get it? Built it. Season one. Amazing. As you may remember from that episode, a hover disc uses air to greatly reduce the friction with the ground. Here we go. So what would a hover disc do on a ramp? Right. Only one way to find out. Recap, friction is when two surfaces rub against each other. 
You can have a very small amount of friction or a very large amount, depending on the materials. And using science to reduce friction results in the best sledding experiences. Nicely done. Science, Max. Experiments at large. Your turn. My turn? Yeah, let's okay, do it. Okay, so take those and I'll get this yep. and then I'll give you the helmet. And then we gotta rebuild the, rebuilding the boxes is like the hardest part yeah. of this whole situation. But... Greetings, Science Maximites. Welcome to Science Max <coughs> Experiments at Large. My name is Phil and today we're gonna be looking at the power of mag magnets. You see, magnets are fun things to experiment with because they are really, okay, they're really interesting. Um, this magnet that I've got here is a neodymium magnet or a rare earth magnet. It's one of the, oh, one of the, one of the strongest magnets you can get. Um, a magnet is an object that is attracted to uh, anything that is ferromagnetic, which is iron, nickel, or cobalt. And mag magnets are interesting because they have two sides. There are two, uh, oh, there are two poles. I'd show you, but I can't get the chain off. Hold on one second. Ha-ha! Mm. There are two. Oh, no. There are two poles to every magnet, uh, just like the Earth. There is a North Pole and a South Pole. That's right, the Earth is a giant magnet. So, if you take kitchen magnets, you'll find that there's two different poles. I've written north and south on these ones. They don't normally come like that. If you put the north and the south together, they stick. But if you put the north and north or south and south together, they repel. They repel, see? They don't want to go together at all. And you can force them together if you want, but if you do, they will spring away the second you let them go. Woo! <laughs> but when magnets repel each other, I find that some of the most interesting stuff. Check this out. This is just a small container, and I've got a magnet in here, and I have a loony attached to it so that it fits nicely in the container like that. For the top, I've attached two magnets together, and I have another coin on it. And if you put them in there, I've made sure that the two poles repel each other, which means this magnet will just sit there and float. Magnetic levitation. Very interesting, and you can pop the top on that if you want and just carry around a levitating magnet. Now, there's a couple fancier ways you can levitate stuff with magnets. This is just a wooden frame I've made. Uh, this is completely not necessary. You can use just about anything in your house. A desk lamp works really well. The important part is I've tied a magnet to the end of this arm here, and this is a bolt, which is attracted to the magnet, but it's got a thread tied to it, so it can't get there just far enough that it will actually hang in mid-air. Look at that, it's not attached to anything, it's just being pulled up by the attraction from the magnet. The thing is, as soon as you pull the bolt away far enough, it will lose the attraction and it'll just fall. Very cool. Here's one that's a little bit more complicated, but is also really neat. This one uses disc magnets, which have a circle or a hole in the middle of them here. And you put two around a pencil and then four more in such a position that you can put the pencil against this wood on the side and it will just levitate on its own. You can even give it a spin. Look at that. And if you want to make the levitating pencil yourself, there's step-by-step -step instructions on how to build an easy-peasy version on our website. Meantime, we are going to max this out. Magnetic levitation on Science Max experiments at large. But you're probably thinking, what are we going to levitate? Well, we're going to levitate me. At least, that's the plan. That's why I'm going to the center for skills development and training. Come on. Okay, who turned out the lights? Guys, uh, how? What was that? What is? 
Why is this room so small? And, and only, only going down to waist level. This is the weirdest room I've ever been in. Where, where am I? What's going on? I... Hey, Matt. Hi, Phil. This is Matt. He's from Jobmaster Magnets. Now, you guys use lots of big magnets, right? That's right, we do. Awesome. So maybe you could help me max out this. Wow. You did a great job of building the levitating pencil experiment. Yeah, so what's going on here exactly? Well, all magnets have at least a north and a south pole. Right. And when you put like poles together, they want to repel. Oh, OK. So have you ever levitated a person? Not yet. Well, let's do it. All right. Do you think we can use these? We can try. OK, well, uh, put that one on the ground. And OK, so north. And I'll put the north one on my foot here. And then if I just step, oh, wait a minute. If I step, stop moving. If I step on that. Step on the... Okay, well, first of all, the, this magnet keeps sort of moving right. away from me when I try to push down on it. Uh, what do we do? How do we fix this? Well, we need to keep the magnets in position so that they don't move around when you try to put them together. Yeah, because I have to come straight down on it, don't That's I? That's right. So why don't we attach this one to the floor? Good idea. And then we'll put a board on this one, and we'll see how it goes. Perfect. Okay, let's do it. All right. This is a magnet. This is a magnet. This is a magnet. This is a shoe. What's the difference? To know that, you have to know your magnets. This is a donut. It does not stick to this magnet. This is a spoon. It sticks to this magnet. These paper clips stick to this magnet. This shoe does not. So what has attracted the magnets? Only things that are ferromagnetic. Here's the difference. Horseshoe, horseshoe magnet. This one is a magnet. This one is not. But the horseshoe sticks to the horseshoe magnet, because this one's a magnet and this one is ferromagnetic. Only things that are ferromagnetic are attracted to magnets. Things that are not attracted to magnets, they're not ferromagnetic. Plastic, banana, mitten, sandwich, magazine. No, but how do you know? Do you go around the world sticking a magnet to every single thing one at a time? Hey, Ma, I need you to come over. I need to see if you're ferromagnetic. No, ferromagnetic. No, you don't need to do that. First of all, only metals are ferromagnetic. So that eliminates all your clothing, your luncheon meats, your magazines, what have you. Everything that's not metal, you don't need to worry about. You, never mind, Ma, it doesn't matter. But this clock is metal. It doesn't stick. Well, not all metals are ferromagnetic, mainly just the ones with iron, nickel, or cobalt. And there you have it. Now you know your magnets. I hit the phone on the magnet there. Okay, uh, can you hear me, Ma? Hang up the phone. Hang up. Hang up the phone, Ma. My first attempt at levitating had the magnets sliding all over. So the plan is to take the bottom magnet and attach it to a big wooden board so it won't go anywhere. Then attach another plank to the top magnet to make it a little easier to stand on. Okay, that uh, is definitely attached to the floor. Thank you. All right, now, if I just get this lined up, whoa, look at that. It could totally, oh, wait a minute, totally, it doesn't want to stay put. Oh, wait a minute. They levitate. Come on. Levitate. Why doesn't it want to stay? It just doesn't. Hmm. Should I stand on it? OK, I'll stand on it. Here we go. And ah. Ha! Ah. Am I levitating? No. No. Hmm. So why isn't this working? Well, just like your pencil experiment, we need a shaft through the center to hold the magnets in position. Oh, yeah, maybe we could use like a ring magnet. Yes. That, like we use with the pencil. Right. And? And we're going to need stronger magnets. We're going to need stronger magnets. Are the ring magnets strong? Yes, they can be. Awesome. All right, let's do it. All right. Now it's time for a Science Max quiz. 
Which one of these things do we have magnetism to thank for? Birds flying south in the winter, music, or a sandwich? If you picked A, you're right. Some birds migrate in the spring and fall using the Earth's magnetic field. Many animals can sense the Earth's magnetic field and use it to navigate. Migrating birds fly hundreds or thousands of kilometers north or south when they migrate in the spring and fall. A compass works the same way, by using magnetism to point to the Earth's magnetic north pole. But if you picked B, music, you're right! Here's some music. The way you're hearing this music is because the musicians recorded their instruments using microphones, which use magnets. And then the signal was translated by a computer and stored on its hard drive, which uses magnets. Then it was broadcast to your TV and comes out your speakers, which use, you guessed it, magnets. And for those of you who said you have magnetism to thank for your sandwich, haha, <laughs> well, you're right. You see, you'd probably go to the kitchen to make that sandwich, right? Well, I'm guessing you got all of the tasty ingredients from your refrigerator? Well, it works on electricity, which is produced by magnets. And then there's an electric motor in the fridge that circulates the air and keeps it cool. And guess what? Magnets. And finally, the door on your fridge stays closed because the door has magnets. So there you go. You can thank magnetism for birds flying south, music, and your sandwich. It just goes to show, when you're talking about magnets, everybody wins because magnets are everywhere. This has been a Science Max Quiz. Here's an experiment you can do with a bag of water. Take a sharpened pencil and carefully push it through the bag. If you do it carefully, it won't spill. The reason this works is because the bag is made of polymers, long stretchy chains of molecules, and also because the pressure of the water against the pencil prevents any water from spilling out. Now, we're gonna max it out. This is a very large bag of water, and here I have some very large pencils. You ready? Oh. <laughs> That's one. That's two. Here we go. Should I go from the bottom? Ta-da! Science! Okay, okay, okay. <sighs> I know what you want. <sighs> like I was saying, science! Turns out trying to balance two repelling magnets on top of each other is pretty much impossible. Here's why. This is a magnet, and here is the magnetic field. It's often drawn with lines like this, but actually the magnetic field radiates out in all directions. Really, think of the magnetic field kind of like a ball. When you try to balance another magnet on top of the first magnet, it's about as hard as balancing one ball on top of another ball. So here's the plan. Just like the levitating pencil, we're going to use ring magnets because we can put a shaft through the center of one ring, then drop another ring magnet on the shaft. It will keep them perfectly aligned. Then it's just a matter of putting the bottom magnet on a board to keep it stable and using another board so I can stand on it and ta-da, magnetic levitation. Or at least that's the plan. Okay, board. Magnets. Magnets. Ooh, look at that, awesome. And now I'm gonna put the platform on. Nice. I got some weights here, let's see how this works. Yeah. This is gonna work amazing. All right, think I should try it? Give it a try. Okay. Here we go. 
Huh? Huh? Yeah! I'm doing it! I'm levitating! What? Just a little bit. Oh, really? Yeah. So, hmm. Yeah, what do we do? We need more power. More power? I like that idea. How do we give it more power? Uh, more shafts, more magnets. OK, sure. Well, why don't we do, um, why don't we do one, two, three, four shafts, and then we'll have magnets on all the shafts. Great idea. All right. Let's do it. If you attach something ferromagnetic like this washer to a magnet, not only does it stick, but the magnetic field travels down the metal, making it a magnet too, which means you can stick more and more things to each other, and they will continue to stick until you run out of magnetic field. You can do this yourself at home with anything ferromagnetic. Paper clips work pretty well, or washers like I have, or screws, or bolts, and they'll continue to stick to each other as long as the magnetic field is strong enough. You can see it's getting pretty weak here, and they'll all stay magnetized as long as the first one is still attached to the magnet. But if you want to go even further, all you need to do is keep adding more magnets to reinforce the magnetic field. I've got a few here, like this. Let's get the chain started, like that. And then I've got a magnet attached to this washer, so it will keep the magnetic field strong. And I continue to add um, one magnet, one washer, and we'll just see how far I can go. You can even sculpt it a little bit. Look at that. And then at the end, a whole bunch of paper clips. Eventually, the weight will make it fall off. But it's a lot of fun to play with magnets and make art. Speaking of art you can make with magnets, you can also make sculptures. When everything sticks to everything else, you can make some pretty fancy designs. This is a rare earth magnet, a very strong one, and a bunch of nuts that I've gotten. And this one here is an electromagnet, but electromagnets are a little different because they need an electric current to work. Check this out. This is sort of a magnet dude with crazy hair. There's an earth magnet here, and this is a giant screw, and these are some metal bits, and then I've got two more magnets at the top here to hold on his crazy wire hair. He's got crazy wire hair because he's crazy magnet dude. Now, of course, we couldn't just talk about magnetic sculptures without maxing it out, so let's max it out. This is a bunch of scrap metal from leftover experiments, and I've got a bunch of rare earth magnets, and now I'm gonna max out a magnet sculpture. Let's see. There you go, a maxed out magnet me. I made this guy out of metal pipes with earth magnets in between. And these are his arms attached, of course, with magnets. His hand, his little metal pieces attached with magnet. Steel wool for the hair. And of course, hat non-magnetic. All right, here we go, ready? Uh, uh. Want to see a magic trick? Simple copper tube. Drop things through it. Nothing unusual happens. But watch when I drop a magnet through. What? It's not magic, it's science. Because the magnet creates a magnetic field, when it goes through the tube, the magnetic field repels the magnet upwards. Now, the field isn't perfect, so the magnet doesn't come to a stop. But still, it slows down from a fall to a nice, graceful drop. Take a look from above. Pretty amazing, right? Magnets, not magic, science. So I've managed to levitate on some magnets, but just barely. What Matt and I needed was more power. So instead of having one shaft and one pair of ring magnets, we're going to use a larger board and put a shaft on each corner. Then we'll have four times the power because we're using four times the magnets. 
Hopefully this will be strong enough to get me floating on a cushion of magnetic energy. And magnets? Magnets. Okay, here we go. <laughs> this is gonna work great. And top board. Mm-hmm. Ooh, what do you think? Looks great. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Matt? You're levitating. I'm levitating! Woohoo! All right. It feels cool. It's sort of like, it sort of feels like surfing a little bit. All right, thank you so much, Matt. That was amazing. And there you have it. Science Max, experiments at large, magnetic levitation. You know, I'm surprised we could do an entire episode on magnets and we never actually got them so close to the camera that the camera went all weird because cameras of magnets, they don't, no. oh dear. Uh-oh. Um, no, that's okay. I can, I can, well, I can fix this. If I just, maybe, no. if, maybe if I put the magnet to the camera again, that would, oh, oh, okay, that's uh, not. No. That didn't help. Oh, okay, well, thanks very much for watching uh, Science Max, Experiments at Large, and uh, we'll see you again uh, as soon as we, we get a new camera. Ha! Greetings, Science Maximites. My name is Phil, and this is Science Max Experiments at Large, and this is a syringe. You might know syringes from when you get a needle at the doctor, but syringes are used all the time in science because they let you measure very precise amounts of fluid. Now, check it out. You push the plunger down, and it comes out the top. Or you could pull the plunger in and it would suck more fluid in this way. But check this out. I've got a syringe attached to a hose here and this hose is filled with water. And I wondered if the hose was really, really long, how hard would it be to push this plunger down? Of course, I don't know where the end of the hose is because it was really long and I had to string it all the way around. So, ah, ha, 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 here it is. Okay, so let's find out. Push the syringe down and water will come out the other end of the hose. Pretty cool. You see, this is called hydraulics. Hydraulics is a branch of science that deals with fluids, fluids like water. But hydraulics are also a mechanism used in a lot of machines. Check this out. This is a syringe with a short hose on it, much shorter this time. And I press down on the plunger of the syringe and water comes out. And I pull in on the syringe and water goes back in. Because the plunger is airtight, it allows me to push or pull the water. But what if I close the system and take another syringe and attach it to the end of the hose like this? Well, then, if I push this plunger in, this syringe fills up with water. And then I pull this plunger out, the syringe empties. So check it out, this plunger raises and lowers based on what I'm doing with this plunger. And you know what that means? We've made a remote control. Huh? Check it out. So, if you take two syringes, and you take a hose, and you attach them to something you want a remote control, voila, you can build something like this. We have made our very own robotic arm that you can power remotely with hydraulics. Pretty cool, right? If you want to build one of these yourself, here are the materials you need. First, you need two supports and the arm. I used pieces of wood, but you can use wooden spoons, rulers, or pencils. You'll need some craft sticks, elastics, and a paper plate. And of course, two syringes and a hose, which you can get in an art supply store or a hardware store. Here's how you build your own hydraulically powered arm. First, make the base by tracing holes for your supports the width of a craft stick apart. Cut out the holes and use a craft stick and elastic to secure the supports underneath the plate and on top. Then add some elastics and a piece of craft stick in the middle so the supports won't scrunch together. Because we are holding this whole thing together with elastics. Then get your syringe in there and keep it propped up with more elastics. Then get your arm and slot it in between the supports. The arm should be horizontal when the syringe is half full. Elastics to attach the arm and the syringe. Then push down on this end of the plunger and ha ha, you have a remote control robotic arm. You can also max it out even more by adding more degrees of movement. You can make the arm rotate side to side. You can even add a little claw attachment at the end and power it all using syringes. Ha <laughs> ha, science and hydraulics. So let's max it out. I just, I just need an expert to help me. Uh, let's see. And over in that way. Uh, oh, Chris from Logics Academy, of course. Logics Academy knows all about building robot stuff. I'm sure Chris can totally help me. Let's go. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. 
Oh, hey, Phil. Oh, hey, Chris from Rogers Academy. Great to see you. What uh, took you so long? Uh, how long was I gone? And what's with the uh, orange lab coat? Oh, it happened again. It keeps changing the color of my lab coat. But this time, Chris, I prepared for it, and I wore another lab coat. <laughs> uh, see? Blue? No! Well, you know what? This is happening a lot, Chris. So, so I wore another lab coat <laughs> under this lab coat. I'm gonna have to wear a lot of lab coats, though, because this is happening all the time. We should talk about hydraulics, okay, right? Yes, yeah, because yes. we got some cool stuff planned. Okay, so we're just gonna get the table in here. Oh, okay. This is the Ooh. hydraulic arm. Check it out. Oh, very cool, very cool. If we want to max it out, what can we do? We can make it bigger, if, we can make it What if we arm. did it so that the force you put on this side gets multiplied so that this side's even stronger? Ooh, what do you call that when that happens? Uh, a force multiplier. A force, I like that. Force multiplier, it sounds like a video game. So we would have a lot more power. You have a lot more power, which Ooh. we could do fun stuff. Yeah, so if we had like lots of power, what would we do? We'd like crush something. Yeah, let, let's crush some stuff. Yeah, we could crush some stuff. Okay, can we start with syringes though? Yep, yeah, yeah. And then we'll work up as we go. I like it. So what do we need? Do we need different sizes? So yeah, well, I was thinking we need a small a delicious plate of cheese and crackers, my favorite snack. But these crackers are pretty salty, so I should probably pour myself a glass of water first, huh? No! My cheese and crackers! Why? Why does this happen? Why does the water stick to the glass? Well, because of science. And the reason why it happens gets a little complicated, but it boils down to this one simple thing. Water likes to stick to things. Huh? Huh? Did you see? Did you see how it stuck? No, of course you didn't. You know why? Because it only sticks on a small scale. See those drops of water? That's water sticking to the surface. But it only works when the surface tension of the water is less than the force of gravity, which is why water drops fall when they get bigger. So it sticks to things. That still doesn't explain why you can pour water out of some containers without any drips, and other containers make it nearly impossible. <laughs> It's all about the angle. Water will flow very easily when there isn't a large change in direction, like around the curved top of this glass. But when there's a big change in direction, like at the mouth of this teapot, the water can't make that turn as easily. This is also why pouring from a full glass is much messier than one that's less full. Pouring out of a full glass, the water only needs to change direction this much to flow down the side. But from a half full glass, the water would need to change direction this much. So all this happens because water likes to stick to things. So let's do an experiment and coat this glass with hydrophobic spray. Now, hydrophobic coatings repel water. So if it's repelling the water from the outside of the glass, will we still have the same problem? Well, let's find out. Hydrophobic coated glass, non-hydrophobic coated glass, or just regular glass. Water likes to stick to surfaces, but it can't stick to one coated in hydrophobic coating. That's impressive. Should we try something else? Well, that's one way to solve the dribbling glass problem. Except you can't coat your glasses at home with hydrophobic coating because it's not good to eat. The secret is using a container that has a very sharp angle between where you're pouring the water and the underside of the glass, like this jug. And there you go. Now I can enjoy a nice glass of water with my cheese and crackers. Uh, oh, right, I am. Um, wait, hold on, I can re, I will remake the crackers into, see, look, see, it's just, it's fine. It's fine, I'm not really gonna eat that, I'm just kidding. Chris and I are maxing out our hydraulic crusher. Yes, yes, before we get to that, I have a little game I wanna play. Okay, great. Great, you can pick either the small one. The big one. The, okay. <laughs> so what's the game? Simple thumb war, uh, I'm gonna press down this side, you press down that side, we'll see you win. Okay, okay ready? Yeah. One, two, three, go. Oh, wow, that was really tough. Why was that so hard? Well, Phil, I'm just really strong. Wait a minute, my turn. Okay, one, two, three, go. Yeah, see, pushing down on this one is way easier. You wouldn't it think is. that the small syringe would be easier. Why is that? The reason for it is, is that you have to push this one down a lot farther than you have to push this one okay, down. See? See how oh, far yeah. this one goes? And this one's barely This one moving. travels much more. This is how 
we can exchange a little bit of force over a long distance. That's right. To a, a little bit of distance at a lot of force. That's exactly right. Just like the lever, it's a mechanical advantage. Mm -hmm. But in this case, it's hydraulic advantage. That's right. Chris and I push down on small syringes, which gives us more force on our larger syringes. Our crusher was ready to go. Ooh, how about an orange? One, two, three. We squeeze down and... Oh! Oh! <laughs> then we tried a walnut. Are you allergic to nuts? I am not. One, two, three. Oh! Oh! When we tried a golf ball, we reached the limit of what our plastic syringes and our hands could do. We need to come up with a stronger, more awesome crushing machine using hydraulics. That's right. I have some ideas. Okay, good. We can go to, we can use metal. We can use metal. And we can, and use... we can go bigger as well. Ew, this water is gross, but I'm gonna drink this water. Why? Well, because of science. No, but I'm not gonna drink the water like this. First, I'm gonna use the power of science to help me clean it. How? By using gravel. Gravel, yes, gravel. So, say I've got some dirty water, and there are particles floating in that water. Large particles, your rocks, your wood, these styrofoam bits will act as the large particles. You pour it into the gravel, and the large particles get filtered out. See, nothing but clean, clean water. Yeah, I know what you're thinking, Phil, that's not really clean yet. That's because we haven't done step two, sand. Sand? Yes, sand. Let's say that these plastic beads are small particles. That filters out the tinier stuff. There, huh? Clean, right? Uh, no, it's not very clean. So we filter the water in the next step with charcoal. What? Charcoal? Yes, charcoal. Charcoal works just like gravel and sand, except on a microscopic scale. See, these bits are tiny particles you can't even see. The charcoal catches these like the sand and gravel caught the larger particles. This is called a gravel, sand, and charcoal filter. The gravel catches the big particles, the sand the smaller ones, and the charcoal the microscopic ones. These kinds of filters are used all over the world to clean drinking water. Ah. Delicious. Science. Max Historica. Archimedes. What? Who said that? Uh, it's me, the narrator. We're doing a segment. Oh, well, I was working. Don't sneak up on a guy like that. Uh, <clears throat> this is Archimedes, an ancient inventor and one of the greatest scientific minds ever. <laughs> one of his famous inventions was the Archimedes screw. Ooh, um, um, mm. ah. <laughs> Which was used to make holes in wood. No, that, that's not what it's for. It's, it's for water. Uh, right. Used to make holes in water. What, what, what? No! Look, did you even do your homework? I, um, hold on. It's, uh, yeah. it's here, it's here somewhere. Ah, um, look, I'll just show you. You see, in ancient times, we had many uses for something that could lift water up from a well or to take lake water uh, from uh, the lake and put it into a farmer's field and that sort of thing. Ah, okay, I've got it from here. So, Archimedes invented a screw and he drilled a hole in the side of that container. No, no, no. Uh, look, just just sit down. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll explain it, okay? I am sitting. I'm in a voiceover booth. Good for you. Now be quiet. Now look. What you do is you put the screw in the water like this, and then you want to raise the water higher, you see? And so turn it around like so, and the water fills each gap in the screw, and it starts to come up. It gets to the top, and look at this. Look, we've got water coming at the top there. The water is being pumped up. It is the first water pump. I see. Still seems like a lot of work to fill a glass, but it's very cute. No, we made them bigger. We obviously were not going to make them this big. This is not very useful. Uh, is right, it? Yeah, Archimedes, one of the greatest scientific minds ever. <sighs> Chris and I are maxing out a hydraulic crushing machine. We tried one out of plastic, but now it's time to make one out of metal. These are called hydraulic cylinders, and they work the same as our syringes. Small ones on this side with a lot of travel, and then a larger one on this side to multiply the force. 
and some mechanical advantage with a lever to help us push even harder. We tried crushing a watermelon, and it worked great. So what else do we want to crush? We crushed a coconut. It's cracking. Oh, there we go. Oh, oh it's, it's gonna leak. And then a can of pop. Whoa! Science Max Cola, now in the new smaller can. Let's really challenge this press. Ha ha, perfect. Ha, ha. A piece of wood. We tried to crush the wood, but we weren't able to get it to budge. So it's time to max it out even more. I think we're gonna need like a multi-story industrial sized hydraulic press. You know where we can get one of those? I do. Awesome. This is Water. Things float on water, like pool noodles and wood and toy boats. And now we're going to do an experiment with how paint floats on water. How's this supposed to work again? Oh! I'm supposed to take the paint out of the can first. This is a fun experiment you can do at home. All you need is a container, some water, and paint. But not just any paint, special paint you use for hydro dipping. That's hydro, meaning water, and dipping, meaning uh, dipping. Carefully pour the paint on the water and add a few different colors. Then take a stick to swirl it up into a pattern. Then you get something you want to paint, and you carefully put it in like so. But don't pull it out as soon as you get it in. You have to spread the paint away because it'll stick when you bring it back out. And then when you pull it out, whoa! Hydro dip. Let that dry, and then you have a very cool painted toy. Let's do some other stuff. This is a bike helmet. If you put tape on what you're painting, you can remove it later to make parts that aren't painted. Skateboard. Whoa. <laughs> oh, that's pretty cool. Now to max it out. Hydro dip pants. Wearing the pants when you do this is super messy and not something you should try at home. But the results weren't bad. <laughs> Science. One of the ways you can experience the power of water is watching it wash away dirt. You can experiment with this yourself by making your own erosion table. To make your own, fill a plastic tub with sand and tilt it up. Cut a hole in the tub at the low end and put a hose with a trickle of water at the high end. Then to complete your model, fill it with a little happy town. This small model shows how rivers cut their course to the ocean by following the lowest point. Try to design your town and the layout of the ground so the river goes around the buildings. I'll see you later. I'm going to take a swim in the river now. There are lots of ways to experiment. Change the amount of water or the steepness of the angle. Look at the soil. It's all getting eroded over here. Or the way the town is laid out. Every time you do it, the river goes in a different direction. And have fun. Oh, phew, I'm, I'm tired. I'm just going to lie down. And that is the power of water. <laughs> Chris and I are maxing out a hydraulic crushing machine. What about this? Is this what we're going to use? We went to the Natural Resource Canada's CanMet Materials Laboratory, which is a federal research lab. Oh, this is good. Oh, look at that. Oh, can, is this what we're using? Uh, no, oh, I actually, can use this. Hold on, uh, let me no, figure this maybe, out. Maybe later. What, really? Yeah, it's, it's just over here. CMAT is the largest research center in Canada dedicated to metals and materials research. This is it. This oh, is yeah, it. all right. Hydraulic press. How much force does this apply? This can do 2 million pounds. That's over 900,000 kilograms. Which is about 20 cars. <laughs> Let's crush some stuff! Let's off. Oh, crushing! We gotta get the stuff. We gotta get the stuff. Okay. We started out with the piece of wood which defeated our last press. And go! Oh, wow. Oh. <laughs> I love that sound. Reverse it. it turned our wood into a pancake. Whoa, totally flattened. So it was time to try some other stuff. We crushed a ball of plasticine. <laughs> oh, oh, that's so cool. <laughs> that is neat. You sort of made a rainbow. Yeah. Aluminum foil. Aluminum foil. Yes, it is now a solid plate of aluminum. <laughs> and a basketball. Basketball. Good thing so we got these earplugs in because when it pops, it'll be loud. What? Never mind. Oh, whoa! whoa. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> this hydraulic press was so maxed out, we had to think of the toughest stuff to crush. We crushed hockey pucks, a safe, <laughs> we crushed a hydraulic jack with the hydraulic press. <laughs> this is a metal vice. Hard, strong. Yeah, steel. Heavy, steel. Whoa, look at it bend. Start cleaning all that stuff yeah, up, huh? I think so. Okay.